Hello, my name is Vanessa Liston, and I'd like to thank each of you for coming here today to hear about Civic and our innovations there. We're really looking forward to the discussion and, and how you react to what we're doing. But before I do so and, and start the presentation, I, I'd like to thank uh, Monsieur Dodin for that nice introduction, and also to tell you a little bit about Civic. Civic is a startup organization which was born out of research from us two as citizens. Um, Mark was working in the council and I just finished my PhD. I was concerned about the lack of democracy at the local level, particularly in Ireland, where people don't really feel they have a voice or if they do speak, it's not really listened to. So that started us um, engaging with councils and citizens to see what were the problems and how could we identify a way forward. And actually, the way we saw the problem and the approach we took to addressing this was of so much interest to citizens, councillors and um, council itself in one particular um, area of Dublin that, and the interest from other councils around Ireland that we had to set up a startup in order to roll out these innovations. And we are doing that right now. We are engaged with councils in Ireland who, to quote, want this as soon as possible. Now, the title of our lab is Cyber Deliberation. But before we go there, I think we should focus on what the innovation is that actually gave rise to the cyber deliberation concept. And the fundamental innovation is a new type of public opinion, knowledge. That's what we do at Civic. To understand, let us think about the problem. What do we think of at the moment when we think of public opinion? We probably think of surveys or opinion polls. They capture our answers to pre-worded questions Questions that are formed by experts or governments and so on. But do they actually capture what we really think? If we do want to give our opinion, during the democratic process, we're entitled to write a letter, what's called a submission, to our governments. And we can express this in 10 pages or three pages, where we put all of our information, our values, our beliefs, what's important to us, and what we want as the outcome on this particular project. However, even if you want to make a submission to the European Commission, this is done by email. Tons and tons of emails. How do you manage that? And this is an important question for democracy. If you want to go to a meeting, you're likely to give your opinion with your heartfelt passion. But what happens to that opinion? In very good consultations, it can be captured on a post-it note, as opposed to being summarized in minutes. But what do you do if you're a council official with 400 post-it notes really expressing what people are feeling, all of the diverse views on a particular issue. That was a problem that one of our local governments in Ireland had. They had the best intention to really get people's views on an issue, and they came back with a bag full of post-it notes. How do we run deliberation? How do we run a democracy when we don't really have the tools to understand the meaning in the huge flows of opinion that are not just flowing through the democratic process, but are also now enabled through social media, your opinion that you share with your friends on Facebook, the knowledge you share on Twitter, and so on? Well, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> so that is the starting point of our innovations. There is an urgent need to innovate in how public opinion knowledge is both generated, used, and shared. Let's think of what the ideal solution is. The ideal solution is to be able to see at any point in time, at any place in time, the full diversity of opinion on any issue. But not just that, to be able to understand the underlying structure in it. On any issue, there are only likely to be more than five or six main perspectives to which all opinion is relevant. We then want to be able to find understanding. If we know what the main opinions are, how are people actually thinking about that? And then once we have that knowledge, how can we use it for action? Better deliberation, better decision making, a more sustainable policy. This is what we do at Civic. We have developed three responses software solutions and methods to release an open stream of data that we can all share and see publicly. Civic submissions, consultation and deliberation, we aim to embed both in local government, public organizations, civil society, that through its use will generate visualized understanding of the structure of public opinion. 
What am I talking about? What could possibly be a new type of public opinion? Instead of frequency methods that we're used to, 40% think this in response to this question, we are using a method called Q methodology that is well established in environmental research and policy sciences. However, it is stuck in academia and we want to bring it out. What is it? Q method works with natural opinion flows. The idea is that the structure of the way we think about anything is embedded or flows through the conversations we have and the opinions that we give on it. So the real opinion we should be using in democracy is what we're actually saying. But currently, there are no ways to use actual qualitative statements of opinion in an effective way to generate new knowledge. So what it is, you take, 50, you take a whole stream of opinion that you can capture from submissions, Facebook, consultation meetings, actual statements of what people are saying. You take 50 or so of the most diverse of those and you ask a small sample of the most diverse stakeholders, people who have the strongest opinion that are different on the issue, to rank order these statements on a particular bell-shaped grid. They would take, start with statement one, I think wind farms are great, they're great for the environment. Now an environmentalist is likely to put that statement at the plus five part of the grid, whereas perhaps a, a person that's more interested in business might put that near zero. They're not really that bothered about the environment, but they are very concerned and would put an economic statement right up there at the top. Now by analyzing statistically the relationship and the, what's similar and different in everybody's patterns, the way they put the statements, we can identify five or six main perspectives, how each opinion relates to that, and we can visualize it. Before I show you, Oh, this is an example we ran on the Senate referendum recently in Ireland. There was a referendum a couple of weeks ago to abolish the Senate. All of the opinion polls were saying that the referendum was going to pass and the Senate was going to be abolished, according to the opinion polls reported in each newspaper. However, the outcome was that the referendum um, did not pass and the Senate was kept. Oh, so what we did was, um, <laughs> precisely, what we did was we actually, before the referendum, when the um, information was flowing at its most frequent, we captured a range, a huge diverse range of public opinion on the issue, condensed it down to the most diverse and asked journalists, citizens, senators, politicians, political parties, um, anybody that had given a different type of opinion on the issue to sort these statements. And we found that not only a new perspective on it, you could see the cluster of statements that sort of emerged from the analysis to define each perspective. The first perspective was, keep the Shannon, it's great, it's a place of debate, please don't get rid of it, it's part of our history. The second, abolished, was, doesn't do any good, it's just a talking shop, we can do without it. But the third perspective was, the Senate is useless. <laughs> but keep it because if you get rid of it, the government will have too much power. So keep it until the government is reformed and then you can abolish it. Now this sort of clarity and nuance and difference did not come out in any debate before the referendum and certainly cannot be captured just by reading individual articles, opinions and so on. So we're showing you how this can bring structure. And what's also interesting is that you can actually find the statements where the most opposing groups can actually find consensus, where they're more or less in agreement. You can see that Article 27 does not need to be deleted from the Constitution, was more or less agreed by all of these strongly opposing perspectives. And also that um, money is not an issue in our consideration when considering should we ab abolish the, the, Shannet, the Senate. So these areas of consensus are very important, particularly in a deliberation and a debate, where even if you have opposing groups, there are some opinions in areas where there's room for maneuver, there's room room for forward progress. So for example, we can also graph these and visualize them so that they're very simple to understand. So we can see here that these people on a reform are actually quite strong on a reform. You see the scale 0 to 0.8, mixed, ab abolished, and then none, people that were not on any of these. And if we look, we can see how people relate to the abolished perspective. Re green or reform, 
you can see the colors of the heads moving. And the left is the negative side. So the strongly reformed people are on the negative side quite significantly. Uh, and people can easily understand then through deliberation how people are actually progressing. And I'll talk a little bit about our approach to deliberation shortly. You can then see how each opinion has been reacted to by each holder of each perspective. So those that are, have stronger differences in opinion, in feeling, and those which have less. You also get quite good statistical information that can be cross-analyzed over time. This is a, a new way that's been in use 20 years but has not been used. We can see how it can be of value to um, understanding issues and how they change over time. Our aim is to be able to embed this so that the information, opinions are pushed into a public data bank. The perspectives that are identified are open. The dynamics of change during a deliberation, whether people are coming together, as we saw, uh, as people are, have initial positions and how they change over time, that information is released as open data um, and visualized. Can we think in our work how this is different and how this could be used? I guess that's maybe the conversation we're going to have later. But it's this new approach to knowledge and this new open data that citizens can create in their civil society organizations and local government that can give rise to new innovations. We have just started with our civic innovations, with visualized deliberation. Not only do we use this method so that people can actually rank the statements that are given during a deliberation on a tablet, the information is then pushed to a screen and people can see at different periods in time the change. Once you deliberate and you're in a live meeting such as here, we're debating something, you will have a tablet to be able to select the statements and put them at the different points on the grid to how you react to what is being said. The deliberations are also structured on the points of conflict. So if you think of any conflict, they're usually structured on the values that you have the beliefs, the knowledge that you're bringing to the issue, and what you prefer is the outcome. Value conflicts are usually where the most discrimination comes from and lack of movement in debates. Meta-consensus is the concept under deliberation that was developed by John Dreisek and Simon Niemeyer. Their argument, and maybe we can discuss this later also, is that consensus is exclusionary. If you have consensus, there is probably a minority voice that's just being silent. Um, so, where was I? <laughs> so anyway, so the deliberations are structured according to values, beliefs, and, and preferences. And that can be enabled now, this idea of a meta-consensus, because we have the new knowledge flowing, and we can use, put it in software and keep pumping, generating these data streams. The knowledge live from a deliberation would also be released as open. We have an open opinion knowledge data bank is a new concept now. And finally, new types of representation. If in any issue there are 200 or 300 submissions or people, currently representatives have to respond to and represent each individual person. But if that system knows that there are five main perspectives, you can have your perspective represented not just to the local level, but to the national, regional, EU and global level because it's still the main perspectives. And this is the idea of representing by argument. And I'll just go back to why Q methodology is so important. And it's the foundation of discursive representation. It's because by taking the stakeholders and only 20 of them, finding the underlying perspective, you then put this study on the internet or wherever you like in libraries and the addition of another 10,000 people to it have been shown to not significantly affect the five perspectives, they still emerge because there's only a certain number of ways of looking at something. And because it's five or six, it can also be 10. It can capture all minority perspectives. New types of representation, and that is something that was addressed by Mary Calder this morning. People are not only losing trust, but it's the global organizations that are affecting how people's lives are run. How can we affect representation at the global level? Q methodology can help. And this is what um, scholars in 2008 and 2010 write in their papers. They see constantly the value of this to policy and to politics. 
They're just running one study, but they say it. Q method is an excellent research tool to identify the attitudes and perspectives of underrepresented, ignored, marginalized, or less powerful groups on issues that are important to them. That's by Ellingson in 2010, and Brown, Derning, and Selge in 2008. Q methodology can make the decision-making process more democratic by providing a structure to enable the widest range of attitudes and opinions to be heard. This has constantly been said in papers after papers, but it's stuck in academia. Let's bring it out and let's empower everybody to use this tool to release the sort of knowledge that we need. Change is happening. Local governments are extremely interested in this in Ireland, and we'll be um, working with them in the coming weeks to actually start uh, working with Q. We're already involved with Kilkenny County Council in analysing a major controversy there on an infrastructure project. This is an example, it's a screenshot, but it's an example of the um, opinion flow, the opinion stream that's being captured constantly on this issue in Kilkenny. And if you go there, you'll be able to see on civic.eu, the first page has a set of the most diverse opinions. So if you want to go now and see let me see what the main opinions on this issue are in Kilkenny, because I have an infrastructure project coming in my road, in my city very soon. You can see, and now we can start to see similarities in how people are thinking. So in the future, governments can already anticipate, well, heritage is going to be a huge issue. We know because we've learned. We know because we can see lots and lots of open data sets on public opinion. The challenges, of course, are training, helping and empowering groups to use this. Um, and that would be one of the major challenges, but we aim to have very good um, online training, um, animations, and maybe even yourself, the cartoonist, <laughs> might help as well. Gaming is an issue, um, but because the, the, code, the data is open, all of our products are based on PQ method and open source um, analysis code um, that aims to uh, mitigate that risk. What's needed is a willingness to innovate, but we don't feel that this is a pull. We're already trying to respond and trying to get out quickly what we are doing because there is interest, but that's in the innovators. It needs to diffuse, and a willingness to innovate is needed. To conclude, civic empowers citizens and political actors to ge democratically generate and visualize a new type of public opinion knowledge for more inclusive and transparent deliberations. This new knowledge can bring transparency to consultation processes, enable citizens to have more influence on policy, and support problem solving through the deliberation. So again, in deliberation, your opinion is captured, you're asked to rank and evaluate statements during the deliberation. These are visualized, how you change in the deliberations visualized, so we can see patterns of convergence and divergence, which is actually, for the first time, bringing feedback into a deliberation. New innovations can emerge from this. We're just starting. Anyone here can innovate with this new knowledge. What's the future of democracy? We can't say at this point, but we know it can have open information, create systemic effects. But we do know that civic speaks to the core values that are the cornerstone of democracy. It speaks to equality, because in deliberations, it focuses on beliefs and values values which are often the conflict, um, source of conflict and lead to discrimination, for example, with gay communities. It also speaks to justice, because even the most marginalized people, people who are afraid to speak or afraid to go to consultations, can have their opinion included. And it speaks to freedom, because the more that information is open and public, particularly public opinion information, the more difficult it is to control or manipulate. Thank you for your attention. I hope you find what we've presented interesting, and we certainly look forward to your feedback and to the discussion. Thank you.